Testing. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day three and the final day of Web Summit. How's everyone feeling? Bit of energy, please. Woo! Yes, that's very loud. Sorry. <laughs> so we're starting off the day with two very, very, very special people. This is going to be a session. It's going to be an hour long. Um, we're going to go deeper into civil rights, uh, human rights. Uh, we got two wonderful leaders on stage with us. So we'll start off with a couple of questions and please get, start thinking of your questions. And there's no stupid questions. We have a very good opportunity to be speaking to, firstly, the president of uh, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, Ms. Deborah Archer, who is the first black president or a president of, uh, person of color in 120 years of the ACLU, which is an NGO in the United States. And we also have Dr. C. Valela Mandela, who is the great grandson of Nelson Mandela, and he is the uh, African director for the Journalists for Human Rights, as well as a lecturer in the Nelson Mandela University. So please give them a very warm welcome. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. 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 Hi. Thank you. Hi. Welcome. So, day three. How's the energy feeling? Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I had a round table yesterday. We asked incredible questions. I feel really energized by that conversation. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So, you've been to a few of these as well. How, how's this year going for you? Uh, it's been very exciting. Um, and, of course, uh, a lot of people than the previous one. Um, but it's been an exciting conversation on various stages that I've visited, and more importantly as well, I mean, it's such a privilege and an honor sitting here next to uh, Prof. Uh, Deborah. It's, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yes, some, some legends on stage here. Um, so there was one thing that came up that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I had an, uh, a Nigerian speaker yesterday, Hanu Fijiro, who's a... Uh, a founder of an African fintech in Nigeria, and he was just amazed on, uh, that there was such young um, engineers and people building startups from Portugal and the Western world, and he said, um, if Africa had this kind of level of access, and this word access has been coming up quite a lot, that things would be moving in a lot faster of a direction. So, um, I wanted to start with you in this question on this term of access, um, how do you think your great-grandfather, Nelson Mandela, would employ modern-day level of access in his leadership in the fight for racial equality? Um, I think uh, for me, um, Madiba has been uh, always uh, a kind of a leader who took a more inclusive uh, approach into uh, the dealings within our communities and within our countries. And when you speak of uh, how we would perceive uh, the concept of access, I think they fought uh, against uh, a system that was unequal, an inqua unequal system. They fought against a system that had barriers that relegated them into uh, perpetual servitudes, into uh, pe pe basically peasants. And to, to Madiba, dismantling those structures of inequality and opening up our society to be more inclusive, uh, to be more democratic, is one of the key ideals and values that he stood for. And when, when speaking of access uh, of African startups or organizations in platform of this nature, it's something that is of critical importance and closest to my heart. And you are talking about issues of mobility, for instance, uh, one of the most difficult things that we have noticed uh, for those of African descent coming into a platform, international platform such as this one is the difficulty to even get a visa, regardless of how big and successful the startups and organizations that they are leading, but having access to a simple thing such as a visa is one of the most difficult, difficult things. In fact, You'd remember that even sometime last year during a uh, collision, one of uh, African sisters had to fly with about 20 passports to yeah. Europe just to guarantee access of African people of African descent to platforms such as this. So for me, 
is something that is very much important and it is of, it's something that is so close to, me, to my heart that even when I'm in stages of this nature, I look at it as an opportunity to represent the voice that is underrepresented in such platforms as this. Thank you. Yeah. Deborah, do you have anything you'd like to add on the, the, the term access? Yeah. Uh, thinking about this perspective from the United States, access is a critically important concept in um, protecting civil rights and civil liberties because people who currently have access to opportunity, to education, to resources, to health, to communities of, of opportunity, really do use our systems to prevent other people, particularly people of color, from gaining access. We, over centuries, have developed a system where you have inequitable access to these resources based on um, wealth. And at the end of the day, you really cannot separate the places that people have access to from the opportunities that people have access to. And so racial segregation in our residential communities means that people live in spaces where they don't have access to quality education, where they don't have access to mentorship, where startup organizations or non um, entrepreneurs don't have access to, to capital in the way that they do in other, in other communities. We have a democratic system where we are setting up barriers so certain people, primarily people of color and other marginalized people, don't have access to our democratic uh, process. You mentioned trans we have transportation access issues. We have highways that were built to destroy black and brown communities, to provide access for white communities to their uh, jobs. We have public transportation systems mm. that don't allow communities of color to have the same access. So throughout our system, um, access is a challenge on multi-levels. And how do you see things going in terms of the next step for like, developing access to a higher, to a higher margin you know, mm -hmm. within America? Like, for example, do you feel like the, the Biden-Harris um, presidency so far is being bullish enough with their goals? Um, on some areas and, in, and, and, and not in others. On transportation, I think our, our president is, understands uh, that um, a, a transportation system is not just about moving people from one space to another. Transportation is about access to these opportunities. Mm. But in other areas, I don't think that we're doing enough, and particularly around education. Mm. In our, I, I don't know what international systems call it, but from kindergarten to 12th grade, our elementary and secondary education systems are deeply and profoundly segregated, and we're not doing enough to challenge that segregation and not doing enough to challenge residential segregation. Um, sure. We're doing more about getting financial access to people, uh, so in some areas we're doing well, in, uh, in other areas we're just not even uh, at the starting line. Brilliant. There's um, a term that I used to, I was, uh, when I was researching that I think it's really good to share with the audience that you were talking about a hollow goal in terms of achieving diversity within your own organizations. But the, the, the kind of thing you were saying is that diversity initiatives, programs alone, diverse from larger structural change can mm -hmm. be a hollow goal. So That's that, right basically not to just have black faces in high places, as Rashad Robinson has said before. Yeah. Um, how do organizations and leaders, which will be a lot in the audience, do something that is more than just a hollow goal, even though their intentions would be to be driving diversity initiatives, but what, what is the next step to actually doing something from a structural yeah. standpoint? And I don't want to uh, leave the impression that diversity equity and inclusion is not important. Diversity yeah. is a critically important goal. And it is important that we see leaders um, that look like and reflect the diversity in our community. But I think far too many organizations uh, think that you can bring diverse people into um, your system and then to sit back and all the magic will happen. Uh, and then it's, and it's not true. So first, if you want to have diversity, you have to be committed to uh, tearing down structures and building others uh, to make sure that the kind of people that you want to bring into your organization have access to the resources and opportunities that are going to make them successful in your organization. Yeah. So you can't say that you want to have um, diverse CEO or diverse uh, lawyers within your organization if you're not helping to build a system that allows individuals to get access to the opportunities that are going to make them um, successful in your organization. Thank you. Do you have anything to add for that one? Or I can also, does anyone so far have a question in the audience? Yes, we have two in the front here. 
Uh, uh, David, 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 one here. Hi, thank you. Um, so I've noticed that a lot of the speakers, especially the people of color and the black speakers here, are, are American and also some African. Yeah. But I've so there's a lot of focus about I think race as sort of this outside of Europe issue, and I'm super curious what you think they could do. If, if you think they're doing enough to actually talk about race and racial structures in Europe, and specifically in the context of decolonization, I mean, in the opening night, the uh, Portuguese government official who was speaking literally was like, and thank you for the colonization, for bringing Portugal to where we are. And I, I think this is a very, I'm just curious what you think about this sort of disconnect with mm -hmm. the problems right here at home and making it too much like this is an America problem, this is an Africa problem. Um, uh, I think in a, in a global context, uh, if you're talking about issues of uh, race uh, and discrimination, um, it's something that is a global issue. It's not an African issue. Uh, if you look at, for instance, on how Europe, uh, from a political uh, point of view, has been shifting in terms of the sentiments that most European countries have on issues around immigration, for instance. It speaks into the attitudes that they have insofar as diversity inclusion within their own communities. You have to remember that for me, in my own perspective, I find it puzzling that European societies have an issue with immigration, and yet they are, in, in, in fact, the ones that forced themselves into other nations. During the colonial era, they came to us, they forced themselves to us. And now, when they leave our countries and they leave our continent in a state of instability, it is normal that people are going to try by all means to find alternative ways to seek safe heavens and travel to countries such as Europe, uh, in most European countries. And now, when the European leaders find it difficult to understand and fathom the existence of inequality within their own societies, and yet they are the one that actually created these problems during the colonial e era, I find it very much problematic. I was speaking, for instance, here in Portugal uh, with the community of the black community in Portugal, and we were asking, can you give us roughly, in terms of census, how many black or Brazilians or people of color that lives here in Portugal. And they were saying there's no statistics, there's no information on that because the government has taken deliberate steps as not to include those that come from the African continent or those that come from South America as part and parcel of members or citizens of a country such as Portugal, for instance. So they've taken deliberate steps to exclude such communities despite the fact that they are here and they are part and parcel, they are integral part of the Portuguese community, of the European community. But when government fails to even give steps as to recognize them as citizens and include them in the census, I find that very much problematic. So if you're talking then on issues of inequality, if you're talking about issues of race, issues of racism, it's in fact a global issue. It's not an African issue. It is an issue here in Portugal. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. I think it's an important question uh, that we need to talk about. In the United States, uh, we have to recognize that racism has different faces. And if you're in the northern um, United States, racism looks different than it does in the south. Racism look di looks different for black people than it does uh, for Native Americans or Latinx people. And the same is true internationally. Racism in the United States looks different than it does in other parts of the world, but it's still racism. Uh, and I think um, something that uh, Dr. Mandela said I think is important. One thing that the United States does is collect data, um, gather information, and has these a uh, lot of open conversations. Many other countries don't collect that kind of data, don't share that kind of information, and aren't having those same open conversations, and gives the impression that racism is not a problem in their country, uh, when it, in fact we can see that racism, uh, colonization, has a history throughout the world that we all need to challenge. And so hopefully, what happens from some of these discussions, um, as you said, if they're featuring mostly American um, speakers, is that those folks who are fighting racism in their own country 
uh, can take some lessons from the way that we are engaging and fighting that fight. But I, I would also love to learn from other countries about how we can do better, uh, because we're obviously not winning our fight um, using the strategies that we're using. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Mafalda, we have another question in the front here. Just in the front, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good morning to you all. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on critical race theory and also ask if you think that the fight to teach this matter will uh, expand to Europe anytime soon. Thank you. Uh, I think you can take well, for, so I can talk about critical race theory. Uh, one of the things I do is I'm a, a law professor at NYU Law School and I teach critical race theory. And critical race theory is actually a theory that helps us understand um, how racism persists in its power, how it has continued to grow and evolve um, over centuries so that we can understand the problem in order to intervene in the, in the, in the problem and to challenge racism at its core. Um, but that's not what we're hearing about critical race theory. In the United States, they have taken that term and turned it into something that it's not, have, uh, have used critical race theory to refer to every anti-racist um, measure and initiative and say that critical race theory and anti-racism is anti-American um, and it's anti-white. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's part of, I think, a backlash to the racial reckoning. You saw that um, over years we had um, historical protests around the country protesting racialized police violence and systemic inequality that spread across the world. And critical race theory teaches us that any advance in racial justice is always met with resistance and retrenchment. Two steps forward, one step back. And so the backlash that's being called anti-critical race theory, I think is part of that um, resistance and that retrenchment. It's the, part of the one step back. They want to shut down conversations about race and anti-racism. They don't want us to talk about discrimination and oppression. Yeah. And so they're trying to stop the power in our community, to stop those conversations, to stop us from moving forward. And so that's what I, th that's what I think about uh, the anti-critical race theory. There was a second part to that question, yeah. wasn't there? Uh, what, uh, could you say it again, please? If we get a mic, Mafalda. Yeah, the second part was whether you think that the fight to teach this matter at schools will eventually expand to Europe. I, so I do know that at the college, the university level in law schools in Europe, they, are, they do teach critical race theory. I've had many conversations with um, professors who want resources. I don't think it's being taught to our, it's not, critical race theory is not being taught to our children. Um, children in, in kindergarten, in high school, they're not learning critical race theory. They're learning uh, anti-racism, they're learning about our history, uh, they're learning what systemic inequality is and systemic racism is. I hope that we continue to give those lessons to our children to help them understand our, our history yeah. and that that will extend to Europe. Uh, James Baldwin said, and I'm not going to quote him correctly, that we're caught um, in a web where we don't understand our history, and until we understand our history, we can never be released from it. Mm -hmm. Racism persists because of ignorance. Yeah. And if we're going to fight back, we have to make sure that we're fighting it back against that ignorance, starting with our youngest kids so that they can understand that there's the society that they're growing up in. So I hope that uh, what we're, the, the teaching, the conversations that we're having in the United States do spread to other parts of Europe. Thank you. We have another question here in the front. Uh, David Yet is here. Hi, thank you. Um, we are at Web Summit, and there are many. My, my interest is mostly in financial services. I work for a publication, and there are many fintechs that say, "Oh, we should go to emerging markets. There is a lot of potential there to tap." And many times they are offering uh, solutions like loans or crypto investments, and. I have sometimes a feeling that they are a bit taking advantage of the lack of literacy, financial literacy, of, in some part of the world. Yeah. And my question would be, what do you think these companies that are coming to these communities, saying that they are bringing more opportunities, do uh, they actually give something back to communities? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the first thing to uh, consider is, um, do these organizations really have 
the genuine interest of developing the communities that they are proposing these so-called solutions to? Or it's just merely uh, a ploy to exploit further the resources of those particular communities? For instance, if you bring the debate of crypto uh, currency in the African continent um, a, a, and bringing a kind of an, a financial model that does not recognize the infrastructural issues that are so prevalent in the African continent. Mm -hmm. I was working, for instance, in countries such as South Sudan, and one of the most difficulties that the country had was that there isn't even access to institutions such as the bank. I would literally have to go and withdraw land large sums of funds so that I can pay the staff members in my office because many of them don't even have access to the banks. The banks were only the organizations or in the international institutions and organizations were the only ones that had access into the banking system in, in countries such as uh, South Sudan, for instance. Mm -hmm. And now when you introduce uh, financial models such as these that do not recognize the material conditions of other parts of the world, such as the African continent, what you, ex you do, you're exposing those societies into very problematic and high levels of exploitation because you're bringing systems that do not relate even to the material conditions of that particular space that you're proposing such solutions. For me, it, is, it would be much better if you look at, you come in first in those, institu in, in those communities and be begin by building an infrastructure that is going to enable the people that live within that space to understand and have access first and foremost to such institutions. And the minute people have the infrastructure and the institutions, then they are going to be able to engage in trade in more fair terms than it is currently proposed in spaces such as this, for instance. Thank you. We have a couple more questions, I believe. There's one here, that and the one behind you afterwards. Testing, microphone here. Wait. Yep. Hey, hello. Uh, in the past decade, we've seen many achievements in social rights, uh, and I believe we consider that we were like, in a good wave of it. But in the past years, we have seen that they are not given, and we have seen a backlash uh, of such politics. Mm. Uh, how do we, we stay active? How do we stay mobilized? And what are the next steps? Like, uh, since these achievements are actually not given or guaranteed by anyone, but the mobilized people. Mm -hmm. You can start. Um, well, um, I'll give you an, uh, a brief uh, history of the country that I come in. We emerged from an apartheid regime, um, a very vicious and violent racial conflict, uh, as many would understand apartheid South Africa. And when we, the first step that we agreed on as citizens of South Africa was that we need to engage on the truth and reconciliation process to first and foremost look back on what happened into our past and really understand the injustices that were happening during the apartheid regime. And immediately after we do that, we devise strategies and approach in which we can reconcile our nation, transform the, the institutions uh, that govern the country in order to facilitate these civil liberties. By transforming institutions, for instance, beginning with transforming the constitution itself. But one of the difficulties that we had was the in ability or the inability for the minority of white people in South Africa to understand that in order for us to have to forge a sense of national unity, in order for us to reconcile, there had to be a lot of trade-ons. I'm speaking on issues of land, for instance. I'm speaking on issues of the economy, for instance. When the rest of the world celebrated uh, the reconciliation 
and the dawn of democracy in South Africa, they failed to understand that one of the most difficult problems that we had with that process was a lack of interest by the white minority in the country to actually participate truthfully in the truth and reconciliation process in the country. Today, 28 28 years later, since the dawn of democracy, South Africa is considered as one of the most unequal communities in the world. And it is unequal because the white community refused to fully participate in the reconciliation process. They refused to redistribute the land. They refused to open up the economy. And unfortunately, our leaders at the time, they were very short-sighted. Of course, there are other issues that uh, were at play from geopolitical uh, issues, but they were very short-sighted to assume that the white community is going to come into the table willingly and say, we want to redistribute the land, we want to open up the economy. And today we're finding ourselves in a situation where South Africa is one of the ticking bombs in so far as racial uh, inequality and racial conflict is concerned. And the difficulty with that is the in in inability and the lack of willingness with the white community in the country to come into that negotiation table to say, we want to create a more sustainable, inclusive, and equal society. And one way to do that, we're going to open up the economy. And the second way to do that, we're going to bring about the redress insofar as the question of the land in South Africa is concerned. So for me, there had to be a deliberate and genuine interest on other members of the community to say we have an interest to create a more inclusive, socially just and democratic society. And one way to do that is to be part and parcel of that table, on that negotiation table that seeks to bring about the strategies and, uh, and approaches that are going to enable our societies to move forward. Thank you for that. Do you want yeah, to just that? to add a little bit, because I think it's, um, it's a, a great question. As you said, we all know now <laughs> that whatever advance we have is going to be met with um, this blowback or retrenchment. They're going to try to, um, to, to push us back. Uh, and we have to engage in our advocacy in a way that recognizes that, that this is not um, permanent avenues of opportunity. There are windows of opportunity that we are going to have. And what we need to do is be ready to take advantage of that window. So when the next window of opportunity opens um, to advance these issues in a, in a significant way, we need to be ready to, to, to move forward in a way that um, means that they can't, it makes it harder to push us back, right? So whatever um, plans we have about how we're going to tr change and transform our countries, our communities, and our systems uh, need to be d uh, done in a way that makes it very difficult for them to roll back um, uh, uh, all the way. I think we need to take uh, lessons from each protest and each advance. One of the lessons from uh, this advance uh, was the importance of people working together, of different communities coming together um, to kind of work together. We, if we all come together, there's nothing that we can't achieve yeah. um, as a community. And so uh, recognizing that uh, if it's an issue of racial justice, it's not just a, an issue for um, black people, or other black people, mm. to, uh, other people of color to fight for. It's for all of us to fight for. In the United States right now, we're dealing with the rollback of reproductive uh, rights. With, with women and other people not having access to abortion care in states. That's not an issue just for women to, uh, to fight, because it's not just an issue of reproductive justice. It's an issue of racial justice. It's an issue of economic justice. It's an LGBTQ rights uh, issue. So all of us need to come together to fight. And if we're going to move forward, we need to remember that all of these issues are issues for all of us uh, to care about. Don't wait until your community is targeted fight for all uh, communities to move forward. And then finally, I think something that we need to recognize, uh, because there's always going to be this um, windy path towards justice and equality, is that we have to do, plan this long term. It has to be a long term strategy. In the United States, we often look at this case called Brown versus Board of Education uh, that said you can't have separate schools for black and white children. And people think that Brown happened overnight, that one day a lawyer decided to file the case, they filed the case, and poof, there was equality and people came together. The truth was that Brown was a part of a decades-long campaign to get to that point. And so we have to think about long-term strategy. 
if you want to transform our criminal legal system, if we want to end racialized police violence, if we want economic uh, equality, it's long term. Uh, something we're going to have to do not over weeks or months, um, and not even over years, over decades. Uh, one of my mentors often says to me that we're all drinking from wells that we did not dig and sitting in the shade of trees we did not plant. So I wake up every day thinking about what wells can I dig and what trees can I plant so that the next generation of people who come behind me can enjoy the shade and, and, and drink from those, um, from those wells, fighting for um, a reality that we may never live to see, but we know that it can, it, you know, it can be that way and that it needs to be that way. So uh, to can you continue to fight on. Yeah. Thank you. Hands up again. Testing. Testing. Yes. Awesome. Thank you for that quote. That is super meaningful and related to something that I that I wanted to to ask. Uh, and also, thank you, uh, Dr. Mandal, for for uh, mentioning this previously because I, uh, as an African myself, uh, am very very passionate about this topic. And I feel that we cannot even fully 100% be the consumers of these solutions that come from abroad. Because until we as Africans produce the solutions ourselves because also we are the ones who understand our problems that we have on our continent we will always be dependent on the outside world providing something to us and they have the leverage to to take this away from us and we will never be truly independent so I am I'm very extreme in that in that sense but um, I think uh, especially on the African continent now with a lot of technologies uh, that can transform the continent, it's a lot of young people yeah. that, that can come up, the, the young generation that, that can come up with these ideas. But obviously, there's a lot of stigma around yeah. young ideas everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the audience doesn't know about this, about Africa, in Africa, it's on steroids. The, the, the rigid hierarchies will not allow a young person to speak. Yeah. What is your proposal or solution? How can we overcome these systemic barriers to innovation in Africa? In Africa. Um, thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, you, uh, I, I, I normally say uh, one of the major stumbling block uh, to development and progress in Africa is African, Africans themselves. Um, the African Union uh, produced a document uh, coming from a pan-Africanist point of view uh, looking at African solutions to African problems. But one of the challenges with uh, the policy of African uh, solutions to African problems is that there seems to be no political will on the side of our own African leaders to genuinely bring about the change that is needed within the African continent. Mm. They speak of the need uh, to allow young people to take up space. But when it comes to electing, for instance, giving space uh, to young people to participate in the development of their own communities and to the development of the rest of the African continent, they do not allow a space to do that. It, for instance, it will take me years before I can be recognized as a capable leader that can be part and parcel of the South African government, for instance. I would have to be 45, I would have to be 50. And those are some of the barriers that are stumbling blocks to the development that is needed in the African continent. And they constantly say Afri Africa has one of the most youngest population in the world. And yet, if you look at the structures of government in the African continent, we have one of the most oldest leaders I've ever seen. Mm. And it is precisely because of those barriers that we find it even difficult for us to participate in the development of our own continent. And when you speak of, for instance, of uh, issues of innovation and technology, there should be a representation in numbers of African startups in conferences such as this one, as Web Summit. But the problem is our government are failing to take up steps to make sure that the talent of black, young, African is represented and it flourishes in spaces such as this. It's not that we do not have resources. We do have resources. 
our resources are misused by our own leaders. Instead of prioritizing innovation and, and technology, in, instead of prioritizing investing in the future of the African continent, which is young people, they, they would rather misuse the resources, they would rather engage on issues of corruption and maladministration. And we then come in spaces such as these and we speak, speak of underrepresentation. It's not only uh, uh, an issue, going back to what we're discussing, an issue of access mm. from the mo mobility point of view, it's also the lack of political will by our own leaders in saying we are going to invest in young, brilliant and innovative minds of Africa. We are going to make it, take a deliberate steps to say if Web Summit is happening in 2023, each country is going to invest in about 10 to 15 young startups to come and showcase their talent here. And therefore, when they fail to do that, it actually created the stumbling block to the development that is much more needed in the African continent. Thank you. I just wanted to bring it back a little bit towards education. Yes. You both have a wonderful lineage and experience within the education systems. Do you think there is a necessity for any form of update in terms of how in the state of education in terms of talking about colonization? There's a quote um, that you've said before about how slavery is imprinted in the DNA of the nation, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of around the topics of decolonization, you know, do you think there is a need for an update within the education systems for, at all levels? Um, well, of course, there is, in fact, it's, it's in South Africa, um, between 2015 and 2017, the young people are made a deliberate move to say, we need to call for free education for the poor, for one, to address the issues of inequality as a result of the apartheid regime in South Africa. And, to, and number two, we came together and realized that the education system that we're being given in the country was one that alienates us from the communities that we come from. Mm. We'll go to universities. By the time we come out, we can't even relate to our own people and secondly we can't even have practical skills to directly respond to the material needs of the communities that we come in mm. and that speaks precisely to the kind of the education system that we are being fed when we go to our libraries in the institutions of higher learning in Africa you'll barely find a black professor so when we're calling for decolonization of the education system we're saying we want to read text written by people that look like us, Professor Deborah, people that have a deep understanding and connection yes. to the material conditions and needs of our own people, mm. people that would write and provide an education that would directly respond to those needs, not people that would write from an ivory tower and having no lived experience or realities of the people that they say they're proposing solutions to. Right so those are some of the things that we were calling for when we were calling for the decolonization of the education system in Africa. Yeah. And that is also to say, this is the fact that we do not see black academics in mm -hmm. institutions of higher learning. It creates, it reinforces the mentality that there's nothing that black communities have in terms, they've nothing Black communities have nothing to offer from an intellectual point of view. It creates this misconception that when it comes to knowledge, production, teaching and learning, our people, the least that they, think that they can do is to basically follow the European or Eurocentric ways of teaching and learning and there's nothing that actually our own academics, our own uh, 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 intellectual have to offer that would respond directly to the problems that our communities are facing. So when we then say we need the decolonization of the education system, we want an education system mm -hmm. that would directly respond to the needs of our community. Mm -hmm. And we sure. also want the, the, the education system that would recognize 
the voices of black intellectuals mm. in the education system. Those voices to me are, are an integral part that will bring the kind of transformation that is much more needed within our own community. Thank you. Uh, and from a more uh, nuts and bolts perspective, yeah. you mentioned um, my comment about slavery, because I think we do need to have a better understanding of our history, because it's not history. Um, what we see today is an evolution, very much connected to things that have happened in the past, and I think our education system is failing our students by not helping them understand how we got to where we are, and therefore how do we challenge what we, what we see. Uh, but even on a, a fundamental level, I don't think a lot of students uh, in uh, communities of color and other marginalized communities could come to Web Summit and engage with um, the amazing information and knowledge and people that are here because we're not giving them that foundational um, information to be engaged in this conversation, uh, to understand we have schools that don't have basic science labs, who they don't have computers and the technology education, so they cannot um, uh, really compete. They can't be a part of these conversations. They can't access these opportunities. No. And so I think we need to take a step back and rethink how we, what we think about what fundamental mm. education is, um, given our uh, you know the, the, the new and developing society and technology. Yeah. And then as a, a law professor, I would say, uh, I don't think that we're educating our lawyers or um, in the way to be great advocates, to understand how to work with other communities, to understand how to um, support uh, social justice movements. The, the, the great question about uh, centering the people who are most impacted. I think a lot of uh, organizations that educate leaders, including lawyers, don't talk about the need to center the people who are most impacted. We want to come out front and we want to lead. We have solutions. We want to tell you how best to move forward, but we don't want to take account of the community's needs, desires. They have lived this experience. They know what's best for them and how to move forward. And we need to teach our leaders how to be more collaborative, to be more responsive, um, to be open to what communities want for themselves. Uh, this is a, 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 not a great re uh, remembering of the quote, but the disability justice community in the United States often says something to the effect of nothing about us without us. And we have to bring that into everything that we do to, to stop coming from the outside um, and thinking that we know better than the communities that are living that experience. And that's something uh, that should be done through our education system as we are educating business leaders and lawyers and um, government leaders. They should understand these concepts. They should be central to their education. That's a brilliant quote. It actually complements what you were saying as well. Yeah. Um, one quick follow-up on that. It just, I'm curious, what do you, what's your take on Black History Month? Do you think it's somewhat of a compartmentalization? Or do you think it's something that, should, like, it's not really implemented in Europe that much, for example. Uh, obviously, it doesn't really make sense to do it in, on the continent, uh, I would think. But what, I just wanted to, from yeah. someone on the ground, what do you think about Black History Month? So I have mixed feelings. I, I, I value Black History Month, and I'm glad that we have it. Um, because otherwise, we wouldn't be discussing those, learning about folks, we wouldn't be discussing those issues. Um, but at the same time, we then take this approach. I don't need to discuss it uh, the other 11 months of the year. We'll pack it all into yeah. this one month. Yeah. And it's not something that should be siloed. Mm. Um, black history is history. Mm. And it should be integrated into um, every aspect of our history uh, program and our discussions. And black leaders are leaders. And they should be discussed just as leaders. And the same is true. We have uh, Latino Heritage Month. We are uh, in Native American History Month. The same is true for those, those groups as well. It is all our history, and we should be integrating it um, throughout. I think you know, it's kind of an, an erasure issue, mm -hmm. where when we say leader, you assume white leader, unless I say black leader. When you say um, you know, innovator, we are thinking about white people and not thinking about the other people who are engaged in innovation. Uh, and the siloing of our history contributes to that. But at the same time, again, at, we're at a stage where if we did not have Black History Month, I don't think we'd be having the conversations uh, that, we, that we have at all. Yeah. You're okay there, yeah? Uh, we've got just under 15 minutes left. Uh, hands up, do we have more questions from the audience? Yeah. We have one here, David. Hi, um, when talking about diversity, it always seems to be a visual thing. And I wonder, uh, diversity of thought, especially 
I feel someone could agree with you for 90% of things, and then if it's a hot topic item that someone has a different opinion, the current status seems to be silence them, get them fired, get rid of them. And is that detrimental for future? If people are feeling silence because, I mean, there's Christian communities that don't believe in uh, pro-choice, uh, there's LGBT questions, there's this. So if they agree with 90% of your stance and what you are trying to achieve, but there's this one topic, is the way to go about it as what we're doing right now, Twitter mob, fire them, silence them, exclude them. I feel, mm -hmm. it, will that be detrimental for future community, like anything, how, yeah. how to come to the table together? Thank so you. the ACLU, First Amendment, free speech, engaging in discussions at the core of what we do is a very important value for us. It's central to all of our work and we want to um, create a system and in a world in which everyone has an opportunity to express their opinions. Um, I, I don't think silencing people gets us anywhere. We silence folks and then they go underground with their opinions and their work and uh, we think that we're in a better place than we are. We think we've solved racism and sexism and uh, ableism because those conversations aren't happening when in fact um, we haven't. And so I don't think it's, I don't think the solution is to silence people. Mm. I, I, I think uh, conversations are important. As a law professor, I have lots of conversations with people who I don't uh, agree with and we work together to the extent that we, we can agree and then when we don't agree, uh, we don't work together. At the ACLU, we uh, try to build relationships to advance uh, justice, to advance constitutional rights with organizations that, uh, that agree with us on those issues often don't agree with us on 90% of what we do, but on that 10%, we're going to work with you uh, to move forward. And then on the 90%, other 90%, we can be on the opposite side and we're going to hold you accountable and push you in, in another direction. But it is about a conversation. But I do want to say that in protecting free speech and, um, and wanting to encourage conversation, open dialogue, we still have to recognize the harm that comes to people from those conversations that words have power and words have impact. Mm. Uh, and so it's about finding that right balance where recognizing people's uh, right and importance of them being able to voice their opinions and to have differing opinions, but not to think that it doesn't have repercussions. And so you can say whatever you want, but you don't have to necessarily, you aren't protected from the impact and the repercussions of, of what you've said. Thank you. Yeah. Hands up, do we have any more questions in the audience? We're all okay. Um, just carrying on, Sibylle, I wanted to ask you, we've seen a globally kind of an emergence of more far-right political parties gaining dominance in votes uh, a lot of times in Europe. I'm, um, I'm just wondering why do you think that is? Do you think that's tied with um, an increase again in racial inequity or like what's your take? Do you think this trend is going to continue? Will it um, continue with growth and prominence of far-right parties? Um, for me, I think it's something that is going to be, uh, it, it's something that is going to continue uh, for the longest of times uh, because for one, I think uh, we have a problem, uh, we have a problem with our own uh, communities that fail to hold into account those that advance right-wing attitudes and sentiments within our communities. And there is a tendency to, because we, us who believe, for instance, in more inclusive and democratic uh, institutions, uh, we are being frustrated by the leaders that we thought would represent these ideals when they come into positions of power. Mm. And those who believe in right-wing sentiments, uh, in those who advance populist ideals, tend to be mobilizing in a larger scale. If you look in the Africa, sorry, if you look in the European co uh, continent, for instance, mm. uh, you saw what has recently happened in Italy. Uh, you saw what almost happened in, in France, for instance. Yeah. Uh, we have seen what happened in, in, in countries such as Poland, for instance. It seems to me there is a, a wave of right wing and populist regimes that are coming up and perpetuated, of course, driving narratives of 
anti-immigration narratives. Yeah. And for me, these are some of attitudes and sentiment that actually fuel those right-wing perceptions and those right-wing attitudes and that are, are so prevalent in the European continent today. Mm. And I do not see any end in sight in that because we are frustrated, for instance, by the leaders that we have elected yeah. in positions of power to uh, drive inclusive and democratic governments. They have failed to respond to the material needs of the people. And now those that assume that the alternative way to actually arrive at addressing the needs of the people is to actually focus on, uh, on right-wing attitudes are actually in the rise. Mm. And we are failing as people who believe in democracy, social inclusion, and access to universal declaration of human rights, we are failing because we don't even go into the ballot box. And one way for me to counter the right wing uh, wave, either in the, in, in, in the European continent or even in countries such as we've seen what has happened in Brazil mm -hmm. recently. I, I, uh, I actually congratulate the Brazilians yes. for successfully uh, uh, <laughs> defeating such right-wing movement. Is that we need to begin by mobilizing our people to go into the ballot box. Yeah. Because that's the only way we can protect the ideals that we fought so fiercely for, the ideals for a more inclusive, social, just, and democratic society. If we do not go, regardless of how, of how disgruntled we are with our current leaders, but if we do not go into the ballot box, that what is going to happen is we're going to see the rise of right-wing regimes across the globe. So it is incumbent to us to rise up, stand up, and go and defend democracy, and go defend human rights, and go defend social justice through the ballot box. But if we do not do that, we are going to see uh, what is happening in, 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 in the yeah, European course. continent, even spreading across the globe. The reason why, for instance, we're seeing a turn, a, 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 a turn of tide in countries such as Brazil, mm. the people realize that the only way that democracy, social justice, and inclusion can survive is if the people are mobilized and they go into the ballot box and defend such ideals. Regardless of how disgruntled we are with the leaders that we've, we think we've charged them with the responsibility to drive the democratic agenda. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I have two kind of quick follow-up questions and we're uh, going to be close to running out of time. The first one is something, Deborah, that you'd mentioned about the concept of one step forward, two steps back. Mm -hmm. There's a... Uh, and that's tied to a lot of different things in terms of when you're trying to do all the important, meaningful work and you keep getting rolling, kind of getting hit, basically, and yeah. having to get back up again. As well as when you meet other people within kind of the community that are coming to you saying, we're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, same with you, we, we expect more from you, and you're doing your best. Do you have anything, because there's going to be quite relevant things for everyone in the audience in that. Do you have any advice on that concept of when you feel like things are one step forward two steps back and when people don't know how much you're doing but they come for you for more yeah I, I think people should expect a lot from us that we're an organization that says that we are uh, fighting to protect civil rights and civil liberties we see ourselves as an organization that's fighting to uh, kind of bridge the gap between the America that's promised and the America that is and if we put ourselves out as that we're doing that I think it's okay for people to expect a lot from us in terms of the work that we're doing and they should expect a lot from us in how we're doing that work, um, that we are doing in a way that is respectful to the communities that we're working alongside. Uh, but it is hard work. Mm. It is challenging work. And I think um, what I would want those folks to understand is that, as I said earlier, change can't come overnight. That often, you know, we're, we're right now uh, engaged in this fight to restore access to a, a abortion care, to restore the, the, the opportunity to choose what you do with your own body. But that's not, there's no quick fix. We filed, um, I want to say 10 or 15, uh, 12 cases uh, in the, the days after Roe versus Wade was overturned, and people still said, you're not doing enough, we need to fix this now. 
But the campaign to tear down Roe versus Wade was waged over decades, and the campaign to rebuild that right is going to have to take decades. And so we're doing that work, but there is no overnight fix. We just have to continue to fight um, and, and move forward. It's the same with uh, slavery in the United States. Uh, those who fought for freedom woke up every day fighting for freedom. It took them centuries to achieve that, but they woke up every day believing that there would be a world in which they were free uh, and moved in that direction. We're doing all the work that we can now to make sure that every person has the ability to live a life with dignity and respect, has the ability to live a choice-filled life, has the access to all the opportunities and resources that we talked about. But it is going to take time, and we have to be patient and we have to be determined. We have to continue to push forward because the only alternative is to allow them to push us back, and that really isn't an option. Uh, so each and every day, have faith that the people who believe in justice are fighting for it with every tool that we have available. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, just one thing to just advice for the audience on, on the topic of confidence. Firstly, have you both always been confident since growing up, or is it something in terms of that you developed over time? Because you obviously mm. need confidence and conviction when you're driving these kind of things as well. So we have a lot of leaders in the audience, I'm sure. Do you have any kind of notes, something that you could share on the topic of confidence advice for people? Um, for me, maybe I'll, I'll take a very uh, different approach in, in responding to that. Um, because I come from a society where for the longest time we've been made to believe that we are second class citizens, that uh, we've always been relegated in this uh, level of perpetual savages. We have been oppressed, suppressed for the longest of time. We have been stripped of our own identity. We have been stripped of our own dignity uh, under the apartheid regime and the colonial regime in Africa. Um, one of the things that um, my family has always done was to inculcate a culture that when I go and introduce myself in an audience, I must say, I, my name is Siabulela Mandela. I am a descendant of King Gubengnuk. I, I come from the kingdom of the Tembu people. I stand in the shoulders of Madiba Sopicho Yemyem Ngolom Sila Zondaba Zondo. And that is to say, that is to keep me grounded to understand that I do not walk alone first and foremost. And secondly, I come, I'm, I'm, I come from a lineage of kings and queens. And no matter who tells me that I am nothing, no matter who tells me that I am a second class citizen, I am a king. I come from a kingdom led by kings and queens and therefore I am worthy to be in the space that I am in. That is where you begin to draw that source, se uh, uh, sense of confidence to say you know who you are and you know where you come from so therefore the path forward might might as well be clear because you know where you come from and you know what your people did for you to be where you are at this moment so that is how I draw my sense of uh, strength and confidence in a way my story is a little different I don't come from uh, kings and queens <laughs> at least I don't know that I do um, I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college uh, and my family were immigrants to the United States, so I'm also the first um, generation American citizen. And so I struggled with believing that I belong. I struggled with um, knowing how to take you know, advantage of opportunities. And so sitting here today just seems unreal to me. The, 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 if my 10-year-old self would never believe <laughs> uh, that, I was, that I was here today. And I think the important thing is to fight back, for me, um, against the, the, the messages that you're told, sexism, racism, um, all of those things work by c trying to convince you that you don't belong, that you don't deserve access to opportunities, and you don't deserve um, all the benefits that, uh, that others enjoy. And so for me to kind of push back against that and to build that confidence, I just show up every day and remind myself that I deserve to be here, 
I deserve to have access in the way that other people have access. I belong, and I really, I literally have that written on my wall in my office. Act like you belong because you do. Yeah. And that's how I um, try to show up every day to have confidence to lead, um, but also it's, it's, it's my obligation. I have been given so much. People have poured into me. I am here not because I was the smartest or the hardest working, but because so many people supported me, saw something in me, believed in me before I believed in myself. Uh, and so for those of you who have access to resources and opportunity, to find someone who has potential and for you to invest in them, for you to support them, for you to open the door and provide them access um, so that they can live their best life too. Ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Archer and Sue Malena, please give them a round